Our next speaker is uh, Professor Larry Squire from the University of California. Thank you very much. Well, whenever specific questions arise about memory, its relative accuracy or inaccuracy, its proneness to distortion, its capacity for, re for resuscitating very remote events that had seemed lost to recall, one starting point is to explore some general questions about what memory is, how it works, and how the brain actually accomplishes learning and memory. And I'm welcome the opportunity to be here to participate in this scientific session. I propose to review for you this morning three aspects of memory and brain which can provide, I think, a framework for considering the specific topic before us. The first issue concerns the organization of the brain's perceptual processing machinery and the crucial idea that memory is stored distributedly as outcomes of perceptual processing in the same brain regions that are already specialized for the perceiving and analyzing of what it is to be remembered. So there are no memory centers. In the context of our topic, the importance of this point is that the same neural machinery involved in the long-term storage of real visual memories is also involved in perception, visual imagining, and visual daydreaming. The difficulty then that one can have in distinguishing imagined events from events that were told to us by others, from events we experienced ourselves, seems to derive directly from this simple fact that the common brain resources are used to some extent in each case. The second issue that I'll touch on is the fundamental idea that memory is not a single faculty of the mind, but consists of different systems depending on different brain structures and connections. The key distinction is between the capacity for conscious recollection of recently occurring facts and events, what we, the capacity that we ordinarily refer to when we use the term memory, and a heterogeneous collection of non-conscious learning abilities that are expressed through performance in the absence of any necessary conscious content. And in the context of our topic, this aspect of memory raises questions about what it means to have a non-conscious memory, how non-conscious and conscious memories might or might not interact, and whether or not non-conscious memory could ever provide the basis that is a cue or reminder for consciously recollecting an event that would otherwise be inaccessible. The third issue I'll touch on are the concepts of forgetting, normal forgetting, and memory consolidation. These terms refer to the idea that memory is not fixed at the time of learning, but continues to change and be reorganized in substantial ways as time passes after learning. Forgetting occurs, and in addition, the brain organization of conscious memories changes substantially with time. And in the context of our topic, the facts of forgetting and consolidation raise a number of issues about the continuing malleability of memory as time passes after learning. The brain is highly specialized and differentiated organized so that separate regions of neocortex simultaneously carry out computations on separate regions, separate features of di or dimensions of the external world. For example, the analysis of visual pattern, color, location, and movement. What you're seeing here is a lateral view of the primate brain. And what we, we know a lot about vision, the, the dominant sensory modality of all primates, about almost one one, almost 50% of the brain is devoted to the visual system. And what this is showing is, us is that the visual system is organized such that visual, such that visual processing in cortex begins in the rear, posteriorly, and then continues forward at many stations, both in series and in parallel, and as one moves forward in neocortex. One can distinguish between what's sometimes called a ventral stream of information processing that moves forward ventrally to area TE, the infratemporal cortex, the inferior part of the temporal lobe. And roughly speaking, this stream of information processing is concerned with achieving information about the quality of visual objects. One also can de 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 discern a dorsal stream of processing, so-called, which makes its way, way forward to the parietal cortex and has its termination here in area PG in the parietal cortex, and roughly speaking, this stream of processing is concerned with achieving representations that tell us about the location of objects in place, their relationships to other objects in space, and the computations needed to reach out to those objects in space. So the point then is, 
that even to achieve a simple perception of something so simple as a single visual object in space, one must simultaneously engage these geographically distributed processing centers in order to achieve a single perceptual event. This is not happening in one place, but rather in a distributed collection of specialized places in large areas of the brain. And our current understanding that relates perception to memory is that memory is, an ex in a sense, an extension of perception and is stored as outcomes of this kind of perceptual processing. And our current understanding is that memory is stored in the same distributed assembly of structures that are already engaged in the processing and analysis of what is to be remembered. Memories are stored as outcomes of perceptual analysis. So this, in a sense, leads to the idea that memory is both distributed and localized. Memory is distributed in the sense that many neural systems need to participate in the recording of a single event, and memory is localized in the sense that particular brain systems represent specific aspects of each event. Neuroimaging studies show us, for example, that some of the same visual areas of the brain that are activated by visual imaging, visual imagining, are also activated by the act of visual perception itself of a real external, externally presented object. Lesion studies in humans, brain damage studies in humans and in monkeys and in rats have shown us for decades the simple principle that it's often difficult with cortical lesions to distinguish whether the deficit is a deficit of a memory storage loss or whether the deficit is a deficit of information processing loss. For example, there are lesions in the right posterior cortex that will make it difficult for us to recognize human faces, a, def a defect known as prosopagnosia. And it's very difficult to really know whether the essence of that deficit lies in the loss of memory for faces, for stored faces, which happens, or whether the deficit is, in, is really a loss of the perceptual equipment needed to appreciate faces. The fact is that both happen. One loses the perceptual equipment to appreciate faces as well as the possibility of storing the outcomes of that particular kind of computation, namely face analysis and face storage. So then, in a sense, it's, it's fair to say as in terms of our current understanding that the act of recollection of a whole event is a reconstruction biologically and psychologically, in the sense that one must, the brain must reconstruct or re revivify the many component parts of stored material that together constitute a whole remembered event. Thus, there, this, this act of recollection then is not guaranteed by some imagined mechanism whereby all the component parts are stored together or all stored together at the same strength, recall is a constructive process that results in successful retrieval when most of the original elements are revivified together and results in unsuccessful retrieval when an insufficient number of the original elements are revivified together and results in inaccurate recollection when only some elements are revivified or when reconstructive process brings together the elements in incorrect combinations. Now, don't be put off by the complexity of this, but it is a reality check <laughs> on the fact that things are a little more complicated than I've just suggested. This is really a diagram, of the, again, of the monkey brain that shows very much the same information. If you were to tilt this figure t 90 degrees to the right, you would have, again, starting here with area V1, the visual, beginning of visual processing, moving in the dorsal stream along on this side of the, of the, of the screen, and the ventral stream along here. We know that in the, in the monkey, there are more than 30 separate visual areas, each of them having specialized computational jobs, analyzing, processing, computing, and ultimately storing particular aspects of visual features of the world. Now these areas, this, these, this serial and parallel processing converges on a number of so-called convergence zones in the brain and a number of different areas to, that relate to motor function, appreciation of emotion, and so on. And, and it's also, for the present purposes, in terms of thinking about memory, they also uh, converge on areas here in the medial, the inner surface of the temporal lobe, these areas that are named here, I think off the screen, at least I don't see it here, that last little arrow going up to one final structure, the hippocampus. And, it, and these structures that are adjacent to and anatomically related to the hippocampus. And one important hint about brain organization of memory functions comes from the simple uh, collection of facts that if one damages or removes any of these areas down here, one ends up with what one would roughly speaking call a visual processing deficit of some kind. But if one damages these structures up here, these convergence zones of the perceptual processing streams, one instead 
produces a memory impairment, and what is known neurologically as the amnesic syndrome. And I'm going to talk for just a moment about the amnesic syndrome in order to uh, introduce the second point, which is the idea that the brain honors the distinction between many forms of different kinds of memory processing, conscious and non-conscious. This is the ventral, the bottom uh, view of uh, a monkey brain. The, this is the front of the brain, the back of the brain, uh, the, the temporal lobes shown here. And what you're seeing in color here are the areas of these, are these convergence zones we've just been speaking about. The areas that represent convergence zones for all of this cortical processing. So one can think then that processing and ultimately long-term memory storage occurs out here in the neocortex in these specialized areas that we've been speaking about. There's also convergence into this, these areas which are sometimes thought of as memory structures, not because they store the memory, but because there needs to be this interaction between these cortical storage areas and this area of the medial temporal lobe in order to achieve a, the formation of a retrievable, enduring, usable, long-term conscious memory. And when damage occurs bilaterally in this system, as it can in early Alzheimer's disease, as it can in cases of anoxia, loss of oxygen to the brain, uh, loss of blood supply to the brain, ischemia as it's called, there, there then is this syndrome known as amnesia, wh where a memory problem can occur in these circumstances way out of proportion to any other cognitive impairment. And this shows that just psychometrically with patients, uh, again, we're losing the top of the screen. If the projectionist could lower the thing a few millimeters, I think we'd see some information at the top on some of these. In any case, you're seeing the results for 14 amnesic study patients who have normal performance on conventional IQ tests uh, and a very po a poor performance indeed on uh, conventional memory tests. Maybe you just have to actually shrink the thing by about 10% if that's possible. As you may know, both of these commercially available tests is normalized to a score of 100 in the normal population with standard deviations of 15. So you see that these amnesic patients are scoring well above average in their normal intellectual functions, but they're scoring very poorly in their memory functions. And what that's telling us, that the fact that you can have such a thing as amnesic syndrome, that these patients are normal in their, they have their premorbid personality, adequate social skills, they have intact immediate memory, which means they can carry on a normal conversation, uh, they can repeat back a telephone number, uh, the problem, and they can have very good access to their very remote memories, the memories of, especially the memories of early childhood and adolescence. What this dissociation is telling us then is that to some extent the brain has separated its perceptual and intellectual functions from its capacity to lay down in memory the records that ordinarily result from engaging in perceptual and intellectual work. In other words, when you have damage to this medial temporal lobe system, you have a memory problem, but against a background of intact intellectual and perceptual processing. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the syndrome because it's from that syndrome, from studies of the syndrome that we've, that's come to light this issue uh, that's relevant to today, namely the multiplicity of memory systems. Now the, the hallmark of the deficit, what's, what is wrong with the amnesic patients is that they, have, they are profoundly forgetful. That means that they have a difficulty in forming new memories as indicated in this just demonstration experiment where subjects are given a short prose passage of three or four lines to listen to and they're asked to repeat it back in either immediate, both immediately and then after a delay of some 12 minutes, the normal subjects show a little bit of forgetting across that time. The amnesic patients do rather well when there's no delay at all because their immediate memory is intact, is intact although three or four lines of text is already too much really to be held, held within immediate memory. It already taxes their their, their uh, long-term memory, and after 12 minutes, none of the patients is able to remember any of the story at all. Now with this information in front of us that the deficit is a deficit of profound forgetfulness, I just want to make one small digression and make the simple point that what we're talking about here when we talk about amnesia is neurological amnesia and has nothing at all to do with a somewhat more famous kind of amnesia, but much rarer kind of amnesia that's popularized in literature and film, the so-called psychogenic or functional amnesia, where patients have no problem with forgetfulness at all. They have an ongoing record of experiences that they can accumulate. Their problem is a specific problem in in dealing with the past and knowing the past that can include their own identity and that this, and this functional amnesia has no obvious mapping onto brain systems. It's a, so that's why it's, it lives in the realm of psychiatry and in the realm of dissociative states that we'll be hearing about this afternoon from Michael Kenney and some others. But the neurological amnesia is a, an amnesia that falls out directly from be, because of the way the brain itself has organized its learning and memory functions.
Now, the thing that's interesting and has been illuminating about the study of these uh, kinds of patients is that these patients, despite their severe disability, and these patients are disabled, they need supervisory care, they become lost, they don't remember a day from the next day from the next day. These, pa these same patients who are so disabled on conventional learning and memory tests are nevertheless perfectly intact on other kinds of learning and memory tests that, fall into, that turn out to fall into a different class of tests. And I'll give you just a couple examples to give you a flavor of what that means. And this is a simple experiment, subject advantage of a phenomenon that if subjects read a passage of prose aloud, say 20 lines of prose, you read it aloud and then you do it again and then you do it again, you read it a little faster each time. Now if we had heard about this phenomenon 10 or 20 years ago, we would have said, well, you read it faster each time because you remember it. But what I'm telling you this morning is that the kind of memory you use to read a passage of prose faster each time is a very different kind of memory than the kind of memory you use to remember the content of the story. And as you see here, the amnesic patients are showing this facilitation in their reading speed just as well as the normal subjects are, as the control subjects, C-O-N, over three readings of the story. And what's particularly critical is that when you move to a second story, everybody starts over again and gets faster on the second story. What that means is that this facilitation is not some just general ability at getting comfortable reading out loud. Rather, this facilitation is text-specific. It's specific to the text that's presented. It's indicating that in the subject's behavior, there is information about the specific words that have been read. And yet, when one turns to a multiple choice test, the simplest kind of test of all, that asks questions about the story content, the amnesic patients are very disadvantaged compared to the control subjects in terms of remembering what it is they've just done. Now, the, next, the last example I'll give you comes under the, another, another kind of category called priming. And I thought I would do this just as a demonstration to show you that, indeed, these kinds of memory tests really are tapping a non-conscious kind of memory ability. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you might uh, play along, is in the next series of slides, simply say out loud as quickly as you can the name, uh, the name of the object that I present to you. Good job. Now the question of interest is what happened, and I would submit that you probably don't know what happened because we're talking now about a non-conscious memory phenomenon. What happened is that if I had measured your reaction time, as we do in the laboratory, how long it took you to, uh, to name each object, you would have named the, early, the first set of objects in about a thousand milliseconds, about a second to name each one. But when you got to the repeat of the airplane, you would have named it 900 milliseconds. That is, you would have shown a 100 millisecond speed up, a savings of naming this airplane because you'd done it before. It turns out that if I had shown you a, a biplane going in the other direction, something very different, it's something that deserved the same name, but a different looking airplane, about half the effect would have been lost. Because what the brain is doing here is showing some savings from having done exactly the same job recently. You've done the airplane before, it changes your visual system, it, the processing equipment itself has been facilitated, become more fluent, you have in a sense become an expert, a mini expert in doing exactly that job, and when you come back to do it again, you do it faster. The other thing that's really quite surprising and perhaps even less intuitive is the fact that this effect lasts for weeks after a single exposure. It's not just something that happens because it's all within a few seconds. I can come back with my pad of slides a week from now and you would be naming this airplane faster than uh, you did today. And, what's, and then perhaps for the present purposes, the point I wanted to give you is that amnesic patients, the ones who are so disabled, show this effect at full strength. And here are the data that show the naming time for old pictures subtracted from new pictures. And you see a test done at two days and seven days after a single exposure to a, number, a large number of pictures, 50 pictures. And the normal subjects are showing this 100 millisecond savings that I talked about, a tenth of a second faster for the ones they've seen before. And the amnesia patients are showing a slightly larger uh, facilitation, not, uh, not a meaningfully much larger uh, facilitation, but nevertheless a clear advantage that the amnesia patients are having because they've done this before too. But the amnesia patients, unlike the normal subjects, cannot tell the difference between the ones they've seen before and the ones, they've, the ones they haven't. They are almost a chance performance, guessing, in terms of saying, yes, I've seen this picture before, and yes, I haven't. The normal subject can recognize 80% of them. So what that leads us to, then, is this 
notion, which, which has been with us now for about a decade, that we need to think in terms of multiple kinds of memory. In the case of the amnesic patient, to make it more concrete, the kinds of memory that are impaired in amnesia, which depend on the integrity of the brain systems that's damaged in amnesia, on the one hand, and a heterogeneous collection of other kinds of learning and memory abilities, which depend on other brain systems that are intact in these patients, and which can be accomplished normally by the amnesic patient. So what we are talking about here is that a major distinction then between what's been called declarative, explicit, or conscious memory on the one hand, which is impaired in amnesia, and which is the kind of memory we ordinarily mean when we talk about memory, and it's the kind of memory, for the most part, that, we're, that concerns us here at this conference. Non-declarative memory is not a brain systems concept, but rather a heterogeneous collection of different abilities that refers to skill and habit learning, motor skills, for example, perceptual skills, uh, the phenomenon of priming that you just uh, participated in, uh, several kinds of classical conditioning, the development of, uh, of uh, fears and phobias th through experience, and certain revolutionarily early kinds of learning and memory, the thing is referred to as like habituation, getting used to something by just its repeated exposure. So the notion then is declarative memory depends on the hippocampus, these brain systems that are damaged in the amnesic patient, and they afford us the capacity conscious recollections by virtue of their interactions with the neocortical areas that are processing and storing long-term memories. And non-declarative memories are non-conscious. They uh, deserve the term memory because they are, represent ways in which experience can, can affect changes in behavior. That is, we behave differently because of something that came before. That's what we mean by memory. But it's a very different kind of memory because we our, our performance changes, but without affording us even the experience of memory. I mean, I would submit to you that when you said this airplane faster the, the second time, for those of you who you might have been aware of it, you might not have been, but it wasn't certainly the experience of a memory, as you showed the fluency of your, of, of your visual system, the expertise of your visual system in naming the picture faster. So the point then is that in considering how past experience can affect ongoing cognition and behavior, it matters what view one takes about the nature of memory. By the traditional view, which began perhaps with, with Freud, or became famous in, in, in that era, memory is simply a single thing, and it can vary mainly in strength and accessibility. So that, by that idea, if information is unconscious, it's below some threshold of accessibility, and it could potentially be made available to awareness by cues or by strengthening it up or by giving a little bit more rehearsal. And, per, and in some sense there can, be, there can be that phenomenon of things that we don't quite know and then uh, we, we can't quite remember it, the person's name, and then we another rehearsal and then we have it. But the point here is that according to this view that there are multiple forms of memory, the unconscious does not become conscious. The unconscious can't become conscious. It's a different thing. So, inf so information can be stored as a habit, as a disposition to behave in a particular way, but without affording any conscious memory content. Experience accumulates in altered perceptions and altered dispositions and preferences, phobias, conditioned responses, some of our personalities. But expression of these behaviors doesn't guarantee any awareness that behavior is in fact being influenced by past experience. That is, in our personalities, much of which is influenced by our, our experiences, there's no even a sense that we're living out of memory. We're simply being who we are, you might say, well, we've always been this way, but in some of it's a memory, some of it may be genetic, but some of it is, in fact, the way we learn to be. Now, the question then inevitably comes up whether or not a non-declarative memory, say, say the, the fluency that you had with the airplane, can a non-declarative memory in some way facilitate declarative memory by providing a cue for its retrieval? Can, can the presence of that airplane in some way uh, bring back a memory that you saw the airplane before? Now, without going, in, there's been some uh, detailed and careful experimentation on this topic. I won't review the data for you, but simply summarize by saying that it's been very difficult to find any evidence that these non-declarative memories can be used as sources of, as retrieval cues. That is, there's very little evidence that when we make a judgment of familiarity, as you might when you saw the familiar airplane, there's no evidence that our fluency our speed with which we are saying it is, is part of that recognition, that recognition. It's as if over here you've got this one brain system that's determining whether you recognize it or not, and you've got this other brain system which is allowing you to name it faster. So and on reflection, it's perhaps advantageous that the brain does it that way, and that non-conscious memories 
do not ordinarily lead to a feeling of familiarity because rapid detection of a perceptual object, for example, doesn't, does not reliably signal that an object has been encountered recently, that it is, that is familiar, for example, because the object might be detected rapidly because it moved, or it might be, te detected, uh, be, might be detected rapidly because you have a long-standing preference for that particular thing, or you have other experience with it that made you detect it. And at the, at the same time, though, it should be recognized that non-conscious memory processes do have the opportunity to evoke conscious mental states. For example, because perceptual fluency draws one's attention to an object that one otherwise would not have noticed, or because one makes an unexpected response to a stimulus, or a surprising emotional response to some object. And indeed, one could say that the neocortex, the area that processes and stores memories, one could say that the neocortex is available always to interpret any conscious mental content that is produced by these non-conscious processes. It is then a separate question whether such content even refers to a memory, and if it does refer to a memory, whether that memory is accurate or inaccurate. What I'd like to, to, like to turn to finally is the issue of forgetting and consolidation, that is, events that take place over a longer time span and that show us the malleability of memory and the ways in which memory tends to be con con is continually re-sculpted as time passes after learning. And one of the, simple, one of the simplest questions, so one of the most earliest questions that one would ask is, is questions about the forgetting process itself. We know that as time passes, our memories become less acute. We know, for example, that our memory of yesterday is sharper than our memory of a week ago. And we believe, I suppose, we, we know that our, our memory of a week ago is more acute than our memory of a month ago. And even that our memory of six months ago is more acute than our memory of four years ago. But what about our memory of four years ago compared to our memory of 15 years ago? Or our memory of 15 years ago compared to our memory of 30 years ago? One view had been that, well, if something is so important as to be in the memory for a long time, like two or three years, then it just levels off and it doesn't forget, you don't forget it anymore. There's a sort of a perma store. You come down a little bit, months, years, and then zoom, that's it. There's no more forgetting. On the other hand, it's possible that forgetting over the years works just like forgetting over the hours with the same kinds of mathematical functions and the same curves and the same gradual forgetting. It's, easy, it's difficult, as you can imagine, to get direct answers to these questions because to do the experiment correctly, you'd have to lay down some memories and then follow them for 15 or 20 years. And that experiment actually has not been done. But what we did in an effort to do the second, second best thing was some years ago to develop a memory test based on past events. In order to make those past events as controllable as possible, we developed a memory test based on past television programs which had only been broadcast for a single season. And in this uh, television test, the, uh, pro the programs had information available about the Nielsen ratings and about how many weeks the shows were on the air. So we could make the assumption, rather well justified, I think, that the questions being asked from each different year had all been exposed to the general public to the same extent. That is, there was the opportunity for original learning to the same extent in all these different time domains. The test was organized into a multiple choice, four item, four alternative format. So that in each case, the question was, which of the following was a former television program, and the answer was the answer of the, pro was the program, and then there were three foils, three incorrect answers, which were made up to imitate the style of American television programming naming. And then what we did was, ask, the test then asked about the past 15 years. So that it, on a given year, we would give the test and get information about people's ability to recognize programs that had been one, on one year ago, two years ago, back to 15 years ago. Every year, for nine consecutive years, we administered this test so that after nine years had passed, we had nine different forgetting curves, always looking at the last 15 years, and then we simply averaged those curves on top of each other, and we got the picture shown here over 15 years. So what you're looking at now, really, for the, so for the first time, psychologists are laying out for you what forgetting in very long-term memory looks like. And what it looks like is exactly what it looks like over the hours. That is, there is gradual forgetting, that forgetting becomes less sharp as time passes, but it continues to go down. And in this test, you might, you, this, this is a cup half full, half empty kind of story, of course, because chance is 25% on this four choice test. So although there's been significant forgetting over the years, there's also a lot of memory left for these events that uh, uh, would have been learned during about a six month period before the program was canceled. 
Now, one of the major and deep questions about memory that has been asked for over 100 years is the question that having now looked at this, what is this forgetting? On one view, popular among psychologists and psychotherapists, is the view that forgetting is not really real, but rather just a, a question of interference. And it's all really there and can be resuscitated by various techniques like by reminder, hypnosis, the psychotherapy, and so on. The other view, much more commonly held to by biologists, is the view that forgetting is a real thing. And that forgetting is real in the sense that the melody of an ice cube is real, or the losing of twigs off of a tree is real. Not that, all, not that everything is and it's certainly it is absolutely correct to say that there's always more in our memory than we're able to retrieve at any given one time. But it's not that we shouldn't commit the sort of the iceberg fallacy by saying, well, just because there's a lot more below the surface that we don't see, that doesn't mean that everything is below the surface, just a lot more than we ordinarily can retrieve. And everything that we know about the brain, about the idea that memory is dependent on changes in connections at synapses, that these synapses can get stronger and weaker over time, everything that we know about uh, uh, brain and uh, the development of the nervous system and about changes in the nervous system over time suggest to us that forgetting in humans and in other animals is at least in significant degree related to actual losses of synaptic connections that once served to, to support the memory. That is an actual biological loss of information. The second half of this, uh, I'll, I'll just say that the only direct evidence we have, scientists have yet for this statement, which is a rather, uh, made rather strongly, is in very, rather simple invertebrate animals where simple forms of plasticity of memory have been studied directly and where the neural circuitry and the synaptic changes are known. And one can see, as this habit is forgotten over a period of weeks, one can see the synaptic changes regressing back towards baseline. One can see the actual loss of the biological information in this simple preparation. So forgetting is one thing that happens across time. We think real biological forgetting. And the second thing that happens is as this forgetting occurs, there is major changes in the way the brain has organized this material. And that is, comes out from the simple observation that in amnesic patients, the same amnesic patients we were just talking about a moment ago, these amnesic patients have typically what's known as temporally graded retrograde amnesia. What that means is that not only do they have this profound forgetfulness, but they also have some loss of, of memory for events that occurred before they became amnesic. And this loss is more severe for re recent events as compared to remote events. In other words, the more recent the event, the more vulnerable it is. So here you see this in, in five amnesic patients who became, known, who became amnesic on a known calendar day in the 1980s given a test of about public events that were in the news in the different decades of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Here you see them performing very poorly on questions about the 80s and 70s, but they're performing normally on information that occurred 20, 30 years ago. But what does this mean? These are patients now with damage in the medial temporal lobe. What that's telling us is that this, this system of the brain, that's when damage produces amnesia, that this system is not a permanent repository of memory, because if it were, you wouldn't have this gradient. You just have a memory loss across all time. What this is telling us is that this system of the brain is needed for memory storage for only a limited period of time. And as time passes after learning, there's gradual reorganization of memory storage, whereby the importance of this system gradually diminishes, and a more permanent memory system develops, presumably in the neocortex, where the memories are all the time, and that this system then, is this, the neocortical storage is independent of the hippocampal formation. I'll try to make this more concrete in a moment. So the facts of forgetting and memory consolidation, in a sense, we think then, both, both forgetting and memory consolidation can be related to the idea that what memory depends on ultimately is architectural changes in synaptic strength, weaknesses in, in uh, weakening and strengthening in, in, in synapses. Uh, and it, by this view, there's continuing competition, if you will, for, for, for synaptic strength and, and always throughout time, both gains and losses of synaptic connections. So in the sense, some elements are being lost through forgetting, other elements are being getting, getting stronger through uh, rehearsal and through consolidation. So that one, if you think of 
an ensemble of millions of, of cells and connections that are representing the whole event. Some of that's being lost in a, through attrition, through forgetting, through disuse. Other aspects of it are getting stronger and, and reshaped through rehearsal, through the addition of new events and interfering events. So what one has then in memory is not the idea of something stored away in a pristine un, and protected place that can come out in full view some later time un, untarnished, but rather a system that is becoming weakened and changed and, and parts of it getting stronger, other parts getting weaker. So memory is gradually changing all the time, it's re-sculpting itself, rearranging itself with the passage of time. Okay, so the last slide that I'll show you by way of summarizing then is this uh, lateral view then of the monkey brain. We started by talking about the parietal cortex and temporal lobe areas that are important for uh, uh, spatial memory and visual memory. Uh, what we think happens during the learning of conscious declarative memories is that there needs to be convergence of these neural connections into this medial temporal lobe memory system we've been talking about, the system that, when damaged, produces amnesia. And through changes that occur down here, uh, we have the possibility of binding together all of these different geographically separate elements, that all of which have to be revivified together if there's going to be an accurate recollection of a whole event. And we think that happens by way of these back projections that come back up here, and that allows all these different kernels, all these different nodes of the total ensemble to be activated together in order to give us a reconstruction of a whole event. We know that forgetting occurs, that this thing, these things become more fragmented and weaker over time. Consolidation refers to the idea that we think these things get bound together in neocortex over time so that eventually you can take the system out down here and not interfere with storage or retrieval. That is, eventually this whole thing is being rearranged and re uh, grouped up here so that eventually this system up here can stand on its own without the help of this uh, system. And finally, I've identified for you the fact that there exist all these other uh, kinds of non-declarative implicit memories which depend on other brain systems altogether and which seem to operate rather in parallel with perhaps not as much interaction between the systems as one might intuitively suppose. So if one emphasizes then the distributed nature of long-term memory, the multiplicity of memory systems, the existence of both conscious and non-conscious memory systems, forgetting and consolidation, gradual gains and losses and synaptic strength, continuous re-sculpting of neural networks after learning, then I think one begins to provide a biological account of what psychologists have long understood about memory. Declarative conscious memory is imperfect, subject to error and reconstruction, distortion, and dissociations between confidence and accuracy. Our species seems best adapted for accumulating knowledge, for inference, approximation, concept formation, and classification, not for the literal retaining of the individual examples that lead to and support general knowledge. So in view of the ease with which humans form concepts and generalize from their experiences, perhaps the remarkable thing about declarative memory is that it can so often be accurate. <laughs>